The following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on January 17th, 2022. 8.05 p.m. What would you say if I told you that old Joe Palmer was persecuted for wearing the beard? His story has everything you need. Facial hair, Bronson Alcott, violence, Jesus, Dan Cortez. So was Johnny Damon, no? Didn't Steinbrenner persecute him for having a beard? Good call there. I had a What Would Johnny Damon Do shirt when I lived in Boston. That beard was epic. But apparently not suited for 18th century America. I never knew it, but it seems that the prominent facial hair of the 17th century American colonies was over by the early 18th century. And then, people like Joe Palmer were harassed for having it. It makes sense. The Founding Fathers were pretty clean-shaven. It seems that beards had been out of style for a century by the time old Joe had his troubles. I discovered all this when I stumbled across a picture of his gravestone which said that he was persecuted for wearing the beard. The phrasing is nice. The beard. Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the Brothers Drew Yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about the ever so hirsute and persecuted Joe Palmer. Maybe we'll talk about Dan Cortez. Maybe we'll talk about George Steinbrenner, Jesus, or Johnny Damon. But we haven't plotted an exact course because we want you to join us on that journey. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But before we get all beardy like an assistant coach on Ted Lasso, we need to take a look back because it's always important to make time to cleanse ourselves of our past sins and to continue our boundless quest for self-improvement through worthless information. Thus, it's time for ablutions and edification. Brad, do you remember episode 30 about Magnus for Magnuson and the ants who raise empires? In case you forgot, that's the episode in which you said you have to be able to lift a lot if you want to get a big ball of dung going. I don't remember saying that, but I stand by it. But you do remember the episode, right? It wasn't that long ago. I remember the episode. I don't remember that specific quote, but I'm certain it's true. Well, within that episode, hopefully you recall talking about the fact that it would take 882,700 Magnus Ver Magnusons to lift the Empire State Building. That was a fact that you gave, and that was Magnus Ver Magnusons in their prime. I do remember that because that was an important part of my episode research, yes. And I said, sign me up. Like, get me the Magnus Ver Magnuson clones. I also suggested that if there happened to already be a Magnus for Magnuson convention, like you have with people who share a first name or maybe twins or triplets, I said that if we could just find an already existing Magnus for Magnuson convention that happens to have over 882,700 Magnus for Magnusons, we could just ask them if they want to lift the Empire State Building and it would all be great. Right. But that got me wondering something. How likely is it that we can find a convention where everybody happens to share the same names? Magnus for Magnuson. I was thinking maybe that's not likely, but let's go out there and see what the Guinness Book of World Records has to say on people who share the same name, the largest meetings. And I really found three different answers. There's an answer for a gathering of people with the same first name. There's an answer for people who share the same surname. And there's the largest gathering for people who share the same first and last name. Let's start with the one that has the highest quantity. That would be the amount of people who share the same first name. What is your guess, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, of people who have gathered who share the same first name? I don't know offhand. I do recall there was a large gathering of Joshes in Nebraska, and they had a Josh fight to determine who was (laughs) the best Josh in the world. Weren't there like pillow fights and things there? Yes, I think so. Well, I don't know what the numbers were on that, and I can't actually say for sure that this is the Guinness Book of World Record. The last Guinness Book of World Record I saw um, listed anywhere was that there had been a name that you would actually guess. If if you thought a lot about it, you might come up with the fact that it was a gathering of Muhammads. Ah, yes. And it was a gathering at a festival in Dubai in 2005, but only 1,096 Muhammads, which doesn't seem that high. In fact, that would be fewer than the amount of surnames that I'll mention in a minute. 
Although I didn't see it officially listed as a Guinness Book of World Records record, I did see several articles pointing to a gathering that took place in 2017 in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and that was the 1000 Ivana gathering. It was a gathering of 2,325 Ivans. Huh. I don't know if it's official, but that was the most I could see, and that was from 2017. How many of them shared the last name The Terrible? <laughs> I don't know, maybe two or three. Oh, okay. Who knows? Let's move on, though, to same surnames. And this is on the Guinness Book of World Record website. Do you have any guess as to the largest surname gathering? I'll give you a hint. It's 1,488 people. I would like to say perhaps it's someone in the Middle East or Asia someplace because there are a lot of people yeah. in condensed areas over there. But I don't really know what that last name would be. Well, you're wrong entirely. I was going to say Jones, though, because I don't have any idea on the others. So we're going to Ireland for this one, Letterkenny. Oh. And you have the Gallaghers. 1,488 people gathered at a Gallagher event held in Letterkenny, Ireland on 9 September 2007. So we have 2,325 Ivans, 1,488 Gallaghers. Even if all of the Gallaghers were named Ivan... We're still quite a way short of our 882,700 Magnus for Magnuson. So unfortunately, what I'm finding out is we're very unlikely to be able to pull off the Magnus for Magnuson mega lift of the Empire State Building. But just to finish this all off, we might as well talk about the largest gathering. And again, this is Guinness Book of World Records approved. The largest gathering of people who have the same first and last name. This took place on the 20th of September in 2005 when 164 people sharing the same name gathered on the show of one of the people who had that same first and last name. So Brad, New York, 2005, somebody who has a TV show. I'll even throw in that it is, it is a female. Any guesses? Uh, Ricky Lake. It is none other than a gathering of 164 Martha Stewart's. <laughs> <laughs> was Snoop Dogg there smoking pot with her? I hope that he was, because you'll need to to have 164 Martha Stewart's. I don't know how much 164 Martha Stewart's can lift. I'm going to assume that it's less than 882,000 Magnus or Magnusons, even if she lifted regularly in prison. All right, Brother Brad, with that edification out of the way, we'll switch gears from a woman who is never out of fashion to a man who most regrettably was. What do you have to say on this subject of Joe Palmer and the beard? I mean, persecuted for wearing the beard is all one has to hear to be drawn into this. At least it worked for me. Yeah, it's pretty good. When you first sent it to me, I kind of laughed it off as a silly piece of macabre humor from a time where death stalked in every corner, like tuberculosis. Oh, and cancer. Because you, saw, you sent me the picture and I saw it. I'm like, ah, it's just a joke. So I did my deep research that we always do for these shows. Yes. I was reading about that whole episode, and it was legit persecution for wearing the beard. It's truth in advertising. His gravestone is legit. I think you should tell everybody about it, because I just want to laugh at it. But it wasn't really a <laughs> laughing matter. Well, in telling the story of it, I, I lean heavily, as I believe most accounts of Joe Palmer do, on a book that was written by a guy named Stuart Holbrook in the 1940s. And the more I read about Stuart Holbrook, I think he needs an episode as well. He's a guy whose dad was a Vermont logger, and he worked as a lumberjack when he was a young man. He wasn't a professor or anything in telling these stories, but he did start to write popular American histories. And in 1946, he writes this book called Lost Men in American History. Many of the characters within this book are kind of eccentric and not mainstream characters. So he talks about Joe Palmer. And keep in mind that as he's writing, Stuart Holbrook is not coming from academia, so he doesn't have that background in his writing. But he also doesn't have an academic paycheck paying the bills. So he needs to sell his writing, which means he, he has a certain flair with his writing. Let me just read you the intro, basically, that Stuart Holbrook wrote for this man, Joseph Palmer. There was one eccentric, possibly a fanatic, of the 19th century who may have had no great influence on the United States, yet he was a man to be reckoned with in any discussion of the Bill of Rights. In our own day, when the state everywhere crowds the man, and the trend is toward regimentation. It is well to recall the greatest individualist of his day. He was Joe Palmer of Fitchburg and Harvard, the town, not the college, Massachusetts. 
Holbrook goes on to say that Joe Palmer was a regular he-beard of Old Testament size. <laughs> Is there also a regular she-beard? She-beard, yeah. And there's an orco beard and a battle cat beard as well. <laughs> Switching, I'm bouncing back and forth. There's another, I found an article from the New England Historical Society that provided a lot of my information about Joe Palmer. But it says that he was born in 1789 in a village between Lemonster and Fitchburg, Massachusetts. He fought in the War of 1812. He was described as an honest, kindly man and a good citizen, deeply religious, but tolerant, a man of many intellectual interests. The problem was that he was born almost a century too late and 75 years too soon to wear whiskers with impunity. He was 42 years old in 1830. That's when he moved from his farm to this town of Fitchburg. And he was immediately subjected to ridicule and, and just generally bad treatment from the locals. First off, it was just small boys running around throwing stones at him. <laughs> now, within the society of the day, the only people who were really wearing beards would have been Jewish people. So he was not Jewish, but the boys in town would run around throwing stones at him, calling him old Jew Palmer. The women would sniff and cross the street, according to Holbrook's account. And even old Dr. Williams told Palmer to his face that he should be prosecuted for wearing such a mon monstrosity. And I liked one other account that featured one of the local religious figures, a minister that he called Mr. Trask, told him that he looked like the devil. But Joe Palmer replied by saying, Mr. Trask, are you not mistaken in your comparison of personages? I've never seen a picture of the ruler of the sulfurous regions with much of a beard. But if I remember correctly, Jesus wore a beard not unlike mine. So he's Jesus now. Not only is he wearing the beard, but he's a blasphemer. Definitely, he's a blasphemer. But he's basically has the offense of living in a time period where people weren't wearing the beard. Let's reflect a little bit on American history. Holbrook's account, which leans heavily on an article that came out in the Atlantic in 1938, it goes on to say that Cortez, Ponce de Leon, Cartier, Champlain, Drake, Raleigh, Captain John Smith, DeSoto, all these worthies sported whiskers of varying length and style. Then came the pilgrims and the Puritans, bearded almost to a man when they arrived at the Rock and elsewhere. But things shift gears entirely when we're talking about the Revolution. Not a mustache nor a suspicion of a mutton chop appeared on the faces of Washington, Gates, Green, Knox. But I thought it was really interesting that he also goes on to say that the backwoods general Ethan Allen was also clean shaven. You would think that these guys who are part of this ragtag army running around the woods would have been bearded, but even Ethan Allen was clean shaven. And the British as well, Cornwallis, the Howes, Burgoyne. No signer of the Declaration of Independence had a beard or a mustache. And no president before Lincoln had whiskers aside from a few chops here and there. Even though I've seen pictures of all these people, I feel like I always, I thought of them all having beards. So that kind of blew me away. What say you? The president. So Lincoln was the first president with a beard. I don't know. I didn't check that, but it, it makes sense as I think back. I believe he was. And yep. then every president all the way up to Woodrow Wilson, who did not. So our 16th president was the first one with a beard. Our 27th president is the last one with a beard. No president since uh, Wilson became president has had a beard. Uh, although generally, do most people take their fashion cues from the U.S. presidents other than maybe handsome Franklin Pierce, handsome Frank as he was known? <laughs> Are too many of our presidents known as hot? Yeah, well, Franklin Pierce was movie star looks that one. Yeah, apparently. Do you know why Lincoln had a beard? I don't. I know that when he was elected, he was smooth shaven. But by the time he was inaugurated, he had one. And I'm not sure. It wasn't actually. It was right before he was elected. So right at the end of the campaign. Yeah. He got a letter from Grace Bedell, an 11 year old from Westfield, New York, who told him he would look better and have a better chance of winning if he had a beard. So he grew a beard. Well, he ends up being in pretty plentiful company because Grant, who had only worn a tiny mustache before, ends up having a full beard in the war. Robert E. Lee had a, it was clean shaven before the war. We think of him as having a beard. Jefferson Davis had no beard. And then soon he had one that at least Holbrook said was longer than Lincoln's. And generals on, on all sides of the Civil War were rocking beards. You know, Joe Palmer's in the middle of all this, and he's living during that time when nobody had beards, but he's rocking one. So as we hinted, this certainly leads to problems. And we had just discussed the minor problems. You know, the kids throwing rocks at him. His windows at his house were broken by rowdies. 
you know, people saying mean things. And, and he's even showing up some places and he's definitely getting noticed. Emerson actually came to know him. And this will be a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson listing all these people that came to this one gathering on Chardon Street in 1840. And amongst them, you will hear a hint of a Joe Palmer mention in there. Emerson said, If the assembly was disorderly, it was picturesque. Mad men, mad women, men with beards, dunkers, Muggletonians, groaners, agrarians, Seventh-day Baptists, Quakers, abolitionists, Calvinists, Unitarians, and philosophers all came successfully to the top, seized their moment, if not their hour, wherein to chide or pray or preach or protest. So I guess he's talking about all these people getting up and speaking. Question for you, Brad. Would you listen to a Muggletonian speaking for an hour? Aren't we all Muggletonians, according to Harry (laughs) Potter? I guess. I don't know. But anyway, that convention actually happened after Joe Palmer had become a bit of a celebrity. You began to mention earlier an incident that took place on a communion Sunday in 1830, and then another incident that happened shortly after. Going back to the words of Holbrook, he says, It was a communion Sunday in 1830. Palmer knelt with the rest, only to be publicly humiliated when the officiating clergyman ignored him, passed him by with the communion bread and wine. He arose and strode to the communion table. He lifted the cup to his lips and took a mighty swig. Then he shouted in a voice loud with hurt and anger, I love my Jesus as well and better than any of you. And he went home. But a few days later, and I'll shift to the New England Historical Society's account, Joseph Palmer went to a Fitchburg hotel to deliver meat and cucumbers. Four men approached him with scissors and razors and tried to cut off his beard. Brad, have you ever tried to assault somebody by cutting off their beard? I have never considered cutting off anyone's beard or hair in any way. How about your own? You're rocking a mohawk like right now. That's not a mohawk. Mm. It's my summer running hair. Oh, I do cut Father Art's hair. (laughs) Very nice. Is it his summer running hair too? Uh, His hair is the same all year round. So (laughs) I guess he just has running hair. All right. So Joe Palmer's delivering his meat and cucumbers to a hotel. Four men approach him with scissors and razors to cut off his beard. But Palmer fights back, cutting two of the men's legs with his jackknife. For defending himself, local authorities arrested him and charged him with unprovoked assault. Sounds pretty provoked to me, but... It did sound provoked, yes. Judge David Brigham orders him to pay a $10 fine, $40 in court fees, and a $700 bond, which would have been a lot of money, presumably back then. And Palmer chose to go to the Worcester County Jail instead. So he's in jail, and his jailers keep mistreating him for having the beard. They're kind of starving him. Other prisoners are trying to cut off his beard. But he begins a letter-writing campaign to the sheriff complaining about his treatment and to the media to let them know what's going on. And local newspapers pick up his story, and soon the county is feeling embarrassed. And the sheriff and other people come and ask him to pay his fine and leave the jail. And he says, no, I am not leaving. As Holbrook wrote, nothing could move him who was now widely known as the bearded prisoner of Worcester. So he sat there in his chair like a whiskered Buddha until the desperate sheriff and jailers picked him up in his chair and carried him to the street. Other accounts say that after his elderly mom came to visit him, he did pay his fine and leave. So I don't know which one to believe. But the better story is the jailers having to pick him up and basically kick him out of jail so he would stop writing letters to say how bad they were treating him. Bearded Joe Palmer does not escape from jail, nor is he released. He is kicked out of jail for having the beard. It's quite the, I mean, it is quite the story. Um, (laughs) And I'm I'm surprised that beards really started to come back into fashion during the Civil War, because having a beard was like inviting lice into your family. But did you know being clean shaven with the cuts and and micro abrasions and things in your face actually enables you to play host to a whole different group of scary things and possibly even more than having the beard? So we're back to death stalking in every corner. (laughs) Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, I saw I was looking into a few stats about facial hair, and I decided not to really pursue it. But it said something like 23 or 25 percent of American men say they can't really grow a beard. And uh, sadly, that's me. Uh, Not sadly for me. I I wouldn't want one for sure. If I had been Joe Palmer, I would have said, sure, I'll shave my beard. I don't want (laughs) to go to jail. What fashion or style choice would you not change and make a stand for and, and go to jail instead? I mean, I don't have any particular fashion. You cut your own hair. You actually make some effort to do something with it that's at least fun, if not um, if not nice. Um, 
I don't I don't make any effort. My goal is to get it like as short as I'm comfortable with it and let it grow out until I think it looks horrible and I cut it again. But I started cutting my own hair uh, when studying abroad in the year of our Lord, 1999, because I didn't know how to tell French people how to cut my hair. But really, I wouldn't have cared what the result was. So I'm not really sure how I started doing it. But I have saved hundreds of dollars at this point. And I don't know that I would uh, make a stand for any particular fashion. I like a certain clothing. I like my Asics Onitsuka Tiger shoes, but I'm not about to go to jail for them. No. I mean, there's probably something in this world that I would care about enough I would go to jail for. I don't know what it is. Me either. But I do recall you having a What Would Johnny Damon Do t-shirt. I did. For our tens of international listeners listeners in 30 plus countries who might not be aware, (laughs) Johnny Damon is a professional baseball player for the Boston Red Sox, who then went and played for the New York Yankees. Their rival. You had the shirt from when he played at Boston, and he was allowed to have the long hair and beard. And then when he went to New York, he had to cut his beard to be able to sign with them. Yeah. Do you think Joe Palmer would have agreed to shave his beard for the equivalent annual salary that Johnny Damon shaved his beard for? I'm actually going to say no. And I have a good reason. All right. Yeah. What did Johnny Damon make? Johnny Damon made $13 million per year, which in 1830 money for old Joe would have been around $413,000 per year. See, after all this stuff goes down with his beard and all that, I mean, I guess it's still going on, but once Joe Palmer became a sympathetic character for his beard and his letters he wrote from prison, he didn't get harassed anymore after that. So then he starts running around in the circles with, you know, William Lloyd Garrison, Ralph Aldo Emerson, the Alcotts, and he becomes a society figure, but he's still an odd one. Your question was, do I think that he would have would have shaved his beard for the money? No, because he really fell in with the transcendentalists. And transcendentalists what do they think? Like people are good at their core and it's the institutions of man that corrupt them. And I think money would be one of those institutions that would corrupt people. So I believe Joe Palmer, a guy who went and lives in a commune with the Alcots and others, I don't think he would be swayed by the money. I think he would just grow his beard longer. And I can't obviously pretend to know how much money it would have cost, but he ended up being from Harvard, right? Because he bought the land from the commune after they folded. So he must have had some money. Yeah, I guess so. And by the way, when we're saying this Harvard, this Harvard is totally different from the university, which I thought was weird. Yeah. This commune is a pretty interesting thing. Did you read about that at all? Uh, Only enough to see that they were failing miserably. (laughs) And the only one that knew how to farm was Joe Palmer. It was Joe Palmer. So this commune is called the Fruitlands. It's really Louisa May Alcott is from that area. And her dad, Bronson Alcott, is a huge figure in, in that area during that time period. He goes over there with a friend who has a bunch more money than him called Charles Lane, who's kind of an admirer of his. And they start this commune out in the countryside. And they didn't believe in eating meat, owning property, animal labor, at least initially. Once they realized how hard it is to farm without using animals, they changed their minds on that. They dress in only linen, wore canvas shoes. This is all according to the New England Historical Society. Cold water was their only beverage and they bathed in it. Listen to this team that Bronson Alcott recruits to go there, along with uh, several of his family members, this other guy, Charles Lane, and a few of his family members. Alcott brings his wife and his four daughters. But there's only one other woman named Anna Page, who, by the way, Louise May Alcott says, I hate her. (laughs) She got kicked out of the compound for eating fish. Here are the other people, and I'm taking this from the New England Historical Society. Bronson Alcott managed to recruit only a handful of communards, a baker who eventually became a Catholic priest, a nudist, a cooper who had been committed to an insane asylum, and a man who swore constantly because he believed foul language uplifted his listeners. One communard, Wood Abram, had changed his name from Abraham Wood to free himself from societal control. And oh yes, there was Joseph Palmer, the only farmer in the oddball group who had gone to jail for refusing to cut his beard, which happened before all this. That's quite the team, don't you think? That is quite the team. Yeah, the the nudist Samuel Bowers uh, said that they later started to make him wear a sheet during the day so he could only experiment with being nude at night. And when the townspeople found out that this guy was walking around in a sheet, they went out from the town to investigate the white ghost, as he was called. (laughs) Initially, Louise May Alcott, she likes this drinking the cold water and bathing in the cold water. In August of that year, she says it's great, but their commune only lasts seven months. According to the Historical Society, it says winter was coming. They had little food, hardly any firewood, and wore thin linen clothes. Charles Lane gave up the experiment and took his son to the Shaker community nearby. And on December 10th, in her final entry, 
Louisa May Alcott wrote that they were glad he was gone. Then, in the evening, father and mother and Anna and I had a long talk. It was very unhappy, and we all cried. Anna and I cried in bed, and I prayed to God to keep us all together. Soon, Mrs. Alcott says, that's enough. She borrows some money from her brother, moves him to a farmhouse nearby. Bronson Alcott still refuses to leave. He just lays in bed being depressed for a while until uh, his wife manages to convince him to join her and the children. And that is the story of the ever so successful Fruitlands Commune. Like you said, Joe Palmer ends up buying that land and turning it into a place that he kept for many years. He and his wife actually ran it as a place where he helped out, well, as, as the article says, many hobos, writers, and reformers who came to visit for over 20 years. Neighbors called it Old Palmer's Home for Tramps. <laughs> for tramps? Tramps, yeah. I do have, as we like to do on this show, a quiz for you. Bring it. All right, Brother Jeff. I spent some time looking at interesting epithets on headstones or graves. Ooh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, so it's that time on Things I Text Your Brother that everyone looks forward to. Quiz time! That's not the name of our podcast. <laughs> you said Things I Text Your Brother. Things you're I text you're my now brother. texting the listeners' brothers instead of me? <laughs> I said Things I Text My Brother, didn't I? Uh, maybe once, but not the second time. Our regular listeners know that you don't know the name At of the podcast. At least I was closer than text I send my brother, which is you, usually You were pretty close. All right, what do we got for this quiz? All right. How about, that's all, folks. Uh, that would be whoever uh, wrote the Looney Tunes. I can't yeah, remember his Mel name. Blank. Mel Blank. Mel Blank. Which comedian had, there goes the neighborhood? Don Rickles. Rodney Dangerfield. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. How about this one? Good friends, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Huh? No, don't repeat that. I don't want to hear that again. Who is that? Shakespeare. Ah, uh, yeah. I am ready to meet my maker. Whether my maker is prepared for the great ordeal of meeting me is another matter. Mother Teresa. Winston Churchill. Very close. <laughs> <laughs> they were very similar people. Yes, they were. All right. Uh, one more quiz and then one more interesting one. Whose gravestone simply consists of their name and the word in written underneath? Hmm. I don't know. Jack Lemon. As in Jack Lemon in and then the grave. Ah, well done, Jack Lemon. Well done. And so this is less of a quiz. I'll ask you because maybe you know about this. I did not. Mm. The gravestone says, when I was in the military, they gave me a medal for killing two men and a discharge for loving one. Uh, I don't know. Leonard Matlovich. He was the first member of the U.S. military to out himself publicly. When was that? In 1975, I think. 75, 76. And he, he did it while he was still in service? He was still in the Air Force. Interesting. Yeah. And they gave him a discharge, eventually made it honorable, and he fought it for a few years, you know, five or six years. And at some point, they gave him a settlement, and he just took it because he figured if they put him back in, they'd just find a reason to kick him back out, and he wouldn't get anything. Hmm. So, I mean, he was obviously a gay activist at the time. And, you know, I know of Harvey Milk and some other gay activists yeah, sure. at that time, but I've never heard of Leonard. No, that name is not familiar at all. I feel like I should have. Well, switching gears a little bit from epitaphs, the, the guy whose epitaph we've been focusing on is Joe Palmer and talking about his beard. That got me wondering about some other beard-related history, and I looked up a bunch of articles related to interesting beard-related facts. The one story that I really kind of got into was about Peter the Great and his beard tax. So Peter the Great, between 1697 and 1698, he visited the rest of Europe because Russia was quite a bit behind in a, in a number of different ways. And relying a lot on an article here by Kat Eschner from September 2017 in Smithsonian Magazine, she talks about how their shipping was behind the European powers and a number of different things just about trying to bring Russia up to speed. So he spends a couple of years traveling the rest of Europe in disguise on what he calls the Grand Embassy. So this is a group of about 250 people. It consists of kind of upper crust. So it's high ranking ambassadors and people like that. He's traveling with a bunch of upper class people, but he's not revealing who he is. He spends four months working in a shipyard for the Dutch East India Company, where he learns about shipping innovations. Then he goes to Great Britain, where he continues to study shipbuilding. He works in a dockyard. He visits factories, arsenals, schools, museums, and even attends a session of parliament, which this alone is fascinating to me, that a world leader is hiding in plain sight and doing all this research for two years. That's just a cool concept to think of. 
But he comes back home and he does he does embark on an ambitious project of modernizing Russia, as Kat Eschner says in her article, and he plays a crucial role in westernizing Russia. But when he comes home, he has this triumphant return and a joyous reception, as the article says, was thrown in his honor. And in another article I read by a guy named Jesse Guy Ryan, a beard tax is being proposed in England and it's not the first time. This article describes this gathering that took place. In attendance were his commander of the army, his frequent second-in-command, Fyodor Ramadanovsky, and a host of assorted aides and diplomats. Suddenly, the crowd's mood went from elation to horror, as Peter unexpectedly pulled out a massive barber's razor. As biographer Robert K. Massey writes, after passing among his friends and embracing them, he began shaving off their beards with his own hands. Given his political stature, none of the associates dared question the stunning turn of events. That's pretty cool. The people who weren't happy about this were the leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church, because long flowing beards were considered a symbol of, as this article says, manhood, integrity, and piety, according to Orthodox ideals. And Ivan the Terrible had actually written, oh, it's interesting that we mentioned our Ivans earlier. Yeah. Ivan the Terrible says, and he uses some Joe Palmer phrasing here, shaving the beard is a sin the blood of all martyrs will not wash away. It would mean blemishing the image of man as God created him. Partially because of this orthodox position, Peter did have to back off of just going around, and he probably just didn't have time to go around and shave everyone's beard personally. There's a lot of people. He decides instead of that to put in the tax. That way they didn't have to be forcibly shaved. So there was a sliding scale put in place, and as the article says, Peter turned to taxation to incentivize shaving. With an exception for priests, men who refused to shave their beards were taxed 100 rubles a year, a small fortune at the time. But peasants were held to a modified version of the tax and only required to shave when entering a city or to pay a fine of one kopeck to keep their luxurious facial locks. And to be sure you paid your tax and to prevent you from being forcibly shaved, you were given a beard token, which was minted as proof that the tax had been paid. One side would have had an eagle on it and the other side a bearded face with the phrase, the tax has been taken and the beard is a superfluous burden. By 1772, Peter's beard tax was gone. There is actually kind of a a rumor and even blog posts and and the ever so trustful Wikipedia say that Henry VIII had instituted a beard tax in 1535, but this is heavily disputed. And in fact, a bunch of historians, including this guy named Alan Withy, who is an academic historian of medicine in the body, He told the BBC back in 2016 that contemporary documents do not support the existence of Henry VIII's beard tax. He probably also didn't have a wife tax because he had a lot of wives. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's a good point. But just because Henry VIII probably didn't have a beard tax doesn't mean we couldn't have one. According to this guy, Dr. Alan Withy on his own blog, he wrote an article once called The New Jersey Beard Tax and Other Strange Beard Facts. He said that in 1907, a member of the New Jersey State Legislature introduced a bill for the graded taxation of men with beards. And he actually accused a bunch of these celebrity murderers like H.H. Holmes and other people saying that the beard was partially responsible for their actions. But his proposal was for a tax on facial hair that ran on a sliding scale with what he considered to be levels of nastiness. Here's the scale. For an ordinary beard, the tax was levied or would have been levied at one dollar a year. But from then on, things got stranger. For those men whose whiskers exceeded six inches long, the charge was $2 per inch. Ah, $2 per inch. So it was based on inches. Gotcha. In this case, yeah, once you got longer than six inches of beard, then it was $2 an inch. A bald man with whiskers was punished to the tune of $5, while goatee beards were clearly high on the undesirable list, according to Dr. Withy, coming in at a hefty $10 levy. The final and rather inexplicable stipulation was that if any man dared to sport a red beard, a.k.a. if any man had a ginger beard, an extra 20% was chargeable. But what happened with the bill, and indeed whether it was ever meant to be a serious piece of legislation, is unclear. So this New Jersey tax never went into play. I assume red beards were out because either gingers are the devil, or it makes you look like a pirate because it's like a bloody beard. I have no idea. There's a famous pirate family in the Barbary Coast, the Barbarossas. Their name actually means red beard. All right, Brother Brad, we don't have enough time to talk about pirates, but there is one man who has all the wisdom and eccentricity of Joe Palmer, but none of the facial hair. He's our father art, and we're going to ask him some questions. (laughs) 
Is your historical lack of facial hair a reflection of a desire not to be persecuted for wearing the beard? No. It's more a reflection of the fact that when I was in my late 20s or early 30s, I tried to go a beard and a mustache, and it came out all gray, and I wasn't ready for that at that time. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have facial hair because it was gray too soon. Right. As an honorable and just man yourself, we can assume that you would not advocate the ill treatment of anyone due to their facial hair or hairstyle. However, if you were to identify any one hairstyle or facial hairstyle as being worthy of punishment, what would you choose? I don't like those Van Dyke boots. <laughs> Is it because it's Dutch or just because? Uh, just because. It's not an association with, like, the devil or something? No, 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 I'm not that deep. Is there any historical figure whose facial hair you particularly admire? Well, al almost anybody with, with a full beard. Santa Claus. Santa Claus. You particularly admire Santa Claus. Uh, his hair. Yes. His hair. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not just not just Santa. All right. Joe Palmer's tombstone famously notes of his persecution for wearing the beard. If such a statement became a requirement at the time of everyone's eventual passing, what would be the reason listed for your persecution? For example, mine would be my long ape-like arms. Ooh. Mine probably would say, too smart for his own good. If you do say so yourself. If I do say so myself, yes. <laughs> well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything we need to say about Louisa May Alcott, Rodney Dangerfield, the Muggletonians, handsome Franklin Pierce, Peter the Great, 2,325 people named Ivan, and a he-beard of Old Testament size. But fear not, just as soon as we can dig back into the archives to find another gem of a text exchange, there'll be another episode coming your way. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you liked or what you didn't like, or to tell us about something that we got totally wrong. You might even have enough time to go tell a friend, an enemy, or a sheet-wearing wannabe nudist to give us a listen as well. If you manage to do any of that, the fraternity of Driards will be forever grateful. But most importantly, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. And I heard you say the phrase, you gotta be able to lift a lot if you wanna get a big ball of dung going. And that made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> then I said, yeah, everybody's saying that. And that, that might be, if we ever go a quote for a t-shirt, it might be Brad Drew, you're saying, you got to be able to lift a lot if you want to get a big ball of dung going. It's a fact. <laughs>